Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Wednesday, September 14th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, the Clinton scandals keep piling up as it has now been discovered that Hillary Clinton's State Department laundered money through the Clinton Foundation directly into Bill Clinton's greedy hands. Another criminal investigation is likely, but another whitewash and free pass for Hillary is more likely. Then, hacked email. Guccifer 2.0 reveals how Hillary's health issues have been the hot topic of discussion among political heavyweights for some time. Plus, as Apple and Uber prepare to launch self-driving cars, Walmart begins to develop a self-driving shopping cart. Why is this cart following me? All that plus talk of Hillary skipping the first debate, up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. The Clintons have been building a complex, interconnected crime web for decades. It's taking a very long time for us to under unravel the methods that they're using. But these leaked emails are continuing to pull down the layers one by one. And now we have another layer. Another shoe has dropped. And this is in regard to one of their fundraising schemes, the one that's centered around laureate universities. Now, of course, it's been reported in the last uh, several months. This has been an ongoing uh, story that we've been covering here at InfoWars. Other people have been covering it, even NBC News back August 24th. So that Bill Clinton took $17 million from a for-profit college. They say, well, Hillary is going uh, crazy about all these predatory schools that are uh, using all kinds of uh, tricky marketing to uh, seduce students into signing up for uh, college courses are not really going to do them any good. Actually, you know, that headline says 17 million. It was actually 17.6. If you're going to round it to uh, NBC, take it up to 18 million. But here's uh, where we were, okay? They said, according to tax returns released by the Clinton campaign, again, this is the NBC story from a couple of weeks ago, the Clintons earned a total of $22 million from for-profit education companies. Laureate's paychecks to Bill Clinton made up the bulk of that with $17.6 million going to Bill Clinton in his role as honorary chancellor. And I have to ask, if the honorary chancellor gets $17.6 million, what did they pay the real chancellor? You know, the guy who actually does the work? Somebody, you know, there's, there's a position there that is not strictly honorary. I guess that's the honorarium uh, chancellor. But then we also had this. It's not just the $17.6 million that he got. As Breitbart was pointing a little bit earlier, uh, when the number that we were looking at was about a million dollars less, they said Hillary Clinton's State Department pumped at least $55 million to a group that was run by Laureate's founder and chairman, Douglas Becker, a man with strong ties to the Clinton Global Initiative. And, of course, George Soros was also in tied into this Laureate University. As the Washington Post reported at the time, Laureate has stirred controversy throughout Latin America, where it derives two-thirds of its revenue, $200 million a year, is spent on aggressive telemarketing, flashy Internet banners, Billboards designed to lure often unprepared students from impoverished countries to enroll in its for-profit classes, okay? This is puts a whole new light on this push that we've had from Hillary Clinton for having free college tuition paid. There's a lot of money in this, folks. $200 million just for deceptive advertising. So there is, this is a massive pot of cash. But then it gets more interesting. Because what's just been revealed in some of these emails, and this is an exclusive story from Daily Mail, we see in these back and forth of the emails, we see a pay for play, selling influence through the State Department, using Bill Clinton, paying Bill Clinton fees, sending this money around to the uh, Clinton Foundation to uh, top aide Doug Band, and of course he is involved with the Clinton Foundation, he runs it, okay, asked the U.S. Ambassador to Malaysia, Paul Jones, to attend a public event for Laureate University in Kuala Lumpur, okay, Bill Clinton's office requested favors from the U.S. Ambassador related to that same university, November 2010, Hillary's Deputy Chief of Staff, Huma Abedin, was copied on the messages, and this is where Bill Clinton is getting $17 million. As they point out in the body of the article here, Bill Clinton's office requested favors from the State Department related to Laureate University, a for-profit college in Kuala Lumpur that was paying for the former president millions of dollars as a consultant at the time. Okay, so this is a pay for play. Or is it simply that? Is it simply that? Or is it something that they're doing 
to launder money because they had politicians from that government and from other governments that were getting money from this, putting money into it. This is what we see from organized crime, setting up legitimate businesses. And there's questions as to whether or not, a lot of questions as to whether or not Laureate University is a legitimate business, a legitimate university. Nevertheless, putting these things here and having uh, the access to this money, just as we've seen with Hillary Clinton's emails, making those things so incredibly insecure, as Alex Jones correctly pointed out, could have been a way to just put this information out there for people who had paid her, making it very easy for them to pull that in. Now, also looking at hacked emails, we see Colin Powell talking about, and, and these are new emails that have come out, showing that back in 2015, a year and a half ago, folks, a year and a half ago, Colin Powell and big Democrat donors were talking about Hillary Clinton. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is you look at the mainstream media, what they have focused on are the negative comments from Colin Powell about Donald Trump. Clearly, Colin Powell does not like Donald Trump. Colin Powell is a globalist insider. And if you look at the comments and the people that he's corresponding to, you understand that we have a single party at the top. The distinction between Republican and Democrat has never been phonier. These people are globalists. They are corresponding back and forth. It doesn't matter if they are uh, a label of a Democrat or Republican. But the thing that's interesting, I think, that the mainstream media is not talking about, of course, is Hillary Clinton's health being discussed a year and a half ago. And in that, we see that her so-called pneumonia is nothing new. All the symptoms that we're talking about were there a year and a half ago. A tweet from Lee Fang saying, back in 2015, Leeds and Powell discussed Hillary's health. And of course, Leeds is a Jeffrey Leeds, who is a big time contributor to the Democrat Party, but of course, you know, there isn't any real division, as I said, between the elites and the Democrat and the Republican Party. And in March 2015 email exchange between Colin Powell and Lead, uh, they say that Leeds uh, states that the Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse informed him that Hillary could barely climb the podium steps when the two gave a speech at the same event a few months prior. And they said, uh, Powell commented and said on HDTV, Hillary doesn't look good. She's working herself to death, okay? And that was uh, after the uh, primary in Maine where Sanders had won. They also point out, uh, said Leeds, no one likes Hillary and the criminal thing ain't over. Yeah, they know precisely what is going to happen with that. Now, also interesting revelations coming out of that was the fact that she truly hates, or at least uh, did a year and a half ago, Barack Obama. Maybe she likes him better now that he seems to be one of her key lifelines to the presidency, the thing that she wants more than anything else. And that was the object of her scorn. One of the things that they said was that she wants nothing more than the presidency. That's why I've said many times, if you really want to punish Hillary, she's never going to go to jail, folks. I seriously doubt that even if we have a Republican President Trump, if he would divide the country by sending Hillary to jail. That would really take the people who love her to a new level against Trump. So he would probably give her a pass. Who knows? Maybe he would do the right thing and uh, just let the chips fall where they may. But nevertheless, the thing that would be the greatest punishment for Hillary would be not to get the presidency. That is the center of her scorn. They say that emails reveal that Hillary Clinton cannot forgive President Obama for kicking her ass in 2008. That was the thing that she was so upset about. That was the headlines from the Daily Mail. Now, as, as Obama is pushing her and telling, uh, he actually doesn't have anything that he can really point out that Hillary has accomplished. Uh, he can't really talk about her character, of course, because uh, her character is obvious to everybody. So what he does is he attacks Trump. And listen to what he has to say. Can you imagine Ronald Reagan idolizing somebody like Donald Trump or, uh, idolizes Putin, he says. Now, Donald Trump doesn't idolize Putin. When they asked him in the last uh, forum, the military forum, he said, look, he said some nice things about me. I'm not going to go to war with the guy <laughs> over things. I'll take the compliment, but it's just flattery. I'm still going to be a negotiator. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have my head turned by that kind of flattery. So he shot that down, and yet they continue on with this, just as they continue on with the David Duke endorsement saying, have you uh, denounced him yet? That sort of thing. And I have to say, how can Barack Obama say that Donald Trump, who says, well, I'll take the compliment, uh, we still have to negotiate. How is that idolizing Putin? And how is that showing weakness when we've had Barack Obama 
do his apology tour, going all over the world, bowing and kowtowing to the leaders of minor countries. I mean, that is what we have seen from Barack Obama. Meanwhile, the Washington Post is now saying that Hillary Clinton is very sick with this so-called pneumonia. And we have Chris Saliza saying that uh, she may not recover until late October. Think about the implications of that. Alex Jones broke that down in a special report because, quite frankly, folks, if you look at the schedule, you realize that the debates are coming up uh, September 26th. There's a VP debate October the 4th. Uh, presumably, uh, none of them will catch Hillary's pneumonia. and They'll be able to have that debate. But it would be September the 26th, October the 9th, October the 19th. And yet, the Washington Post is saying Hillary Clinton may not recover from her pneumonia until late October. And one of the things I think is interesting, and one of the reasons why, if you look at the Drudge Report today, we see him saying that the trust in media is at an all-time historic low. That seems to be a repeating headline. <laughs> they continue to sink to new historic lows on a regular basis. And they've hit another one now because of the media coverage of what happened this last weekend. We can see the video. We have people, citizen journalists, who recorded that, put it up on social media, and we have seen how they have censored it, how they have lied about it, how they have lied even about the temperature in New York that day. They lie about everything. So why would we believe anything they say, especially when you look at this long article in the Washington Post by Chris Saliza talking to a doctor about pneumonia and all the different things about pneumonia, not talking to him about, explain to us why Hillary Clinton's symptoms look like a manifestation of pneumonia. That's not really talked about here. Instead, it's like, well, what would happen with pneumonia? There are other media outlets, and we are some of them, who have talked to doctors, and there's many doctors who clearly don't think that pneumonia is the issue. Nevertheless, the mainstream media tells us, if you even question Hillary Clinton's health, you're a sexist. So we're supposed to understand, on the one hand, that women are stronger and better than men in all cases. Now, when that is obviously not true, like in the case of Hillary Clinton, when the woman is too sick to do the job, when she can't even campaign for the presidency here uh, just uh, a few weeks ahead of the uh, actual election, when we point that out, then we are sexist for pointing that out. So they want to play both sides of the woman's card. And this is the mainstream media saying you're sexist if you, heal, if you question Hillary's health. Kathleen Parker, writing for the Washington Post, said anchors and commentators hit auto pundit to produce the question du jour. Can this woman handle the presidency? Please, she wrote. Oh, yeah. You shouldn't even be allowed to ask that question. If you do, you are a deplorable sexist for even questioning this woman. She gets a free pass simply because she's a woman. That is true sexism, folks. That is the sexism that is offered to us by the bigots in the Democrat Party who like to put people in a basket based on their political opinions or the way they look or whatever and never defend that, never look at the individual, only group them into uh, different categories and then uh, throw scorn upon them. That's bigotry, folks. That is true bigotry. She says, would anyone ask the same question about a man under similar circumstances? Well, quite frankly, they should. And they would. And I think they would. OK, they're, they're asking the same questions. They've been challenging Donald Trump's health for quite some time. So rather than appear to be the weaker sex, which is only true as concerns upper body muscle mass. This is still Kathleen Parker writing for The Washington Post. She says Hillary Clinton soldiered on with her campaign schedule. Now, I want to play for you what Christiane Amapore said about uh, the email. She talked to um, Oliver Stone about the DNC emails that were leaked, trying to push this conspiracy theory about Russia being involved. But before I do, she was doing exactly the same thing. She has also come on and said uh, that uh, can't a girl have a sick day or two? <laughs> can't a girl. I thought calling somebody a girl was sexist. I thought calling somebody that is as old as Hillary Clinton and with the credentials that they love to tout about Hillary Clinton, calling her a girl, I thought was the essence of sexism. That's what I mean when I say sexism is an inside job for them. They use it or then they uh, themselves and then they accuse you of doing it even when you're not doing it. Look, uh, she is not a girl. OK, <laughs> she's not even postmenopausal. She is a uh, pre funereal. OK, <laughs> she's about to go in. Uh, let's take a look at then what Christiane Amapur, as CNN did with Oliver Stone, trying to push 
the Russian conspiracy theory about emails. It serves a purpose uh, to disguise what's really going on. The intelligence experts that I've talked to have indicated to me that it's probably an inside job. And uh, what's very important... An inside job from so where? Often is it from the Democrats, from somebody who's worked at the committee. Hacking themselves. Or somebody who knows about it. Well, I'm telling you, I can't go into all that information. But the point is, haven't we missed the contents of what's been revealed? Now, we didn't play all of that clip. Uh, Christiane Amapor was trying for a very long time to sell this idea to the audiences and to get Oliver Stone to play along. But he is too much of a straight shooter. He simply came out, as you heard, and said, uh, that is a great fiction. That idea that Russia is the ones hacking this. He said, that is a great fiction. And she said, well, what could it possibly be? And he said, it's probably an inside job. That's what my intelligence sources that I've worked with on the Snowden movie that's about to come out. And of course, that was why he was on there talking to her. He's talking about his uh, movie on Ed Snowden that's about to come out. He said, my intelligence sources have told me that it's probably an inside job. Of course, that's what uh, William Binney said on our show the former technical head of the NSA. He says, I think it was, uh, it was done in America. It didn't have anything to do with the Russians. This is a man who spent decades monitoring the Russians, looking at the technical data. But she could not believe that, because to her, it was absolutely impossible that anybody would dislike Hillary or the DNC. Look at the polls. That's what we're going to do when we come back right after the break with Owen Schroer. You can trust them to tell you some things. Even though they rig the metrics, we can get a lot of information about this. We've seen Hillary collapse physically, and she is collapsing politically. And as the media tries to cover it up, just as you saw with Christiane Amapur, it gets even more apparent, and they fall with her. We'll be right back. <laughs> Joining me now is Owen Schroer, and as I was saying in the last segment, as Drudge pointed out today, the public's trust in the media is at an all-time historic low. Why is that? Well, Owen, of course, they've covered up the fact that uh, she has physical problems, that she physically collapsed, but they're also covering up the fact that she's collapsing politically, collapsing in the polls. What's behind that? Well, there's still a segment of the media that wants to deny that Donald Trump is now winning in the polls, or they try to make some spin about, oh, it's just momentary or it's just an illusion. Specifically, Bob Beckel from The Hill. Now, I found his coverage of this tremendously hypocritical. He says, every time I think that political analysis and writers will finally recognize that most of them don't understand much about political polls, they prove me wrong. But some of these political pros go on TV, write columns, interpreting polls for millions of voters who are just now beginning to focus on the presidential race. Most voters assume because these political pros are on TV or write for national newspapers, they know politics. This is the same guy whose headline reads, Trump poll numbers show his ceiling of made of steel, not glass. So this guy <laughs> just took his own column and tore his own column apart because Trump has been smashing glass ceilings, David, this entire yeah. time, but he says that it's made of steel. So this is what we're talking about. This is the media, either Bob Beckel just doesn't have a clue what's going on, or he's just outright painting a false narrative. Well, and that's what we say. They're outright painting a false narrative. They're, they're, and that's why the trust in media is, is collapsing on, because people understand the bias. That, that's the thing that has, has come off this time around, as Donald Trump was saying, about the Republicans. Thanks for coming out of the closet and telling us what you really think and what you really represent. We understand now that you are a one party at the top, regardless of whether it's Democrat or Republican. It is a globalist uh, multinational corporation party, okay, both of these people. But that's what we see happening in the political aspect as well. Of course, he's saying, just like Karl Rove said, okay, Bob Beckel is on the Democrat side. Karl Rove was saying uh, Donald Trump has a ceiling of 30%. Remember, that was when we had uh, 16, 17 people in the race, and he was at 30%. He goes, all those people, uh, those voters for these other candidates, none of them are going to come over to Trump when we saw just the opposite happen, okay? So now they're telling us it's a steel ceiling. He isn't going to go anywhere with this. But the other issue is all these different polling organizations that say that they're doing this scientifically. You know, I have to say, when I look at these models, just like the climate change models, Owen, they don't have any scientific basis if they don't agree with the data. When you look at a climate change model, when you look at the weather, when we went to look at the uh, uh, American Meteorological Society, they had all these scientists working on trying to predict the weather. They don't do a good job of that. OK, and so when you've got a model, you have to verify that model. And when I look at what the politicians are doing, they go out with these polls, four or five hundred people. I say we've got a margin of error, of four or five points. 
But when you look at the spread between these polls, it's more than adding up these margin of errors. They've got two uh, margin of error polls of four points, and they've got more than an eight-point spread between these. You've got to say, at some point, some of these people at least don't know what they're talking about. Their models are false. And, and before we get away from the climate thing, I think it's amazing with Hillary collapsing in New York, saying she's overheated. Nobody can even agree on what the temperature was in New York. Have you noticed that? I mean, I snapshotted uh, weather.com, and it showed that it was 78 degrees, 40 miles an hour, 40% humidity, 12 miles per hour winds, and yet we got people saying it was in the 80s trying to cover for Hillary. And when they've got a spread of five or six uh, degrees in the temperature, and these are the people who are telling us the world is going to melt down if we've got a one degree increase in temperature, and they're telling us that it's five or six degrees or even more in New York City and the day that this is happening. And we can all <laughs> look at the weather. We can look at the different thermometers. They can't even agree on the same day what the temperature is. And they're going to tell us that the world is melting down. But going back to the polls, I mean, do you believe these polls? Do you think that there's any scientific validity to these scientific polls? Well, they, they are actually scientific polls, just like the climate rigged sciences they're scientifically rigged to provide the outcome that they desire so they are scientific in the fact that they rig them they only pull the democrats they put the measuring sticks in the more you know hotter areas wherever they're measuring so they are yeah. scientifically rigged to get the outcome they desire but you know it's just funny and, and we'll move on to this because we've got the numbers but you know beckel says trump has not closed any ground against clinton in the last 30 days i mean that is just so inherently false by their own model i, I can't even yeah. i can't even believe somebody would print that i mean i can't even believe somebody would put that down when we have so much evidence look at these polls from the la um times that are probably scientifically rigged against trump but yet he's still winning in this poll trump is up to 46.7 percent clinton is down to 42 and, and it it clearly shows in this poll that since 9 11 clinton has taken a nosedive so how can you say that Trump has gained no ground? That's absurd. Well, at the time that she, they said with their polls, they said, hey, she's up 15 points. Trump just needs to get out. And, of course, they weren't worried about the Republicans losing. They weren't saying, we want somebody that's going to be real competition for us. <laughs> okay, They were trying to use that as a push poll to convince people that he couldn't win so that his supporters would abandon him. Okay, But as you look at that, using these same narratives where they had more Democrats in the polls that they were polling or looking at people that they say are, are likely voters, which means that this is not counting the people who Trump has brought in. His most adamant supporters are people who have been fed up with the political system, who haven't been voting for a long time or not considered to be likely voters by these uh, same metrics that they have. So when you look at all that, even by those measurements, because they haven't changed the way they do the polls. Even by those measurements, she's lost that 15-point lead and is now down at a five-point deficit. That's not a huge story, not for these people. Why? Because they are so incredibly and obviously biased for Hillary. And we've even got the numbers to prove what you just said is right. GOP gaining on Dems in voter, re voter registration in three battleground states. And, and it's not only that the Republicans have more registered voters already in these states, they're also beating the Democrats in newly registered voters. And I think you can make a fair point, and it's been proven in polls, or at least, you know, human intelligence on the streets, or just you talking to friends and family, even Democrats don't like Hillary Clinton. So even registered Democrats, you can't count that as a vote for Hillary Clinton. But look at this, David. You talked about how they never expected Trump to be here. They thought Hillary would walk away with it. But now... Everybody realizes Democrats are panicking. They're already trying to figure out what they're going to do if Hillary can't make it. Uh, they know that Hillary's taken a nosedive since her collapse. It's even on Bloomberg, nervous Democrats fret about Clinton stumbles as race tightens. So, you know, it, it's funny. It's like, oh, she can do it. Nobody can beat her. Trump doesn't have a chance. Well, now here we are just what, like maybe 80 or 70 days from the election. It's, it's pretty close. And now it looks like Hillary is the one that doesn't have a chance. And the Democrats are the ones panicking. And I just I, I can't help but laugh at the Democratic Party right now. If they would have nominated Sanders, they would have a real shot at this election. Do you think they're regretting and kicking themselves in the foot for not nominating Sanders? Of course, it was rigged, but I yeah. don't know. Of course, it's rigged. And of course, it's the insiders who are doing this. And they're they're not only are they dishonest. Owen, but they are arrogant about their dishonesty, okay? Just like we see these ridiculous stories that Hillary Clinton was feeding everybody in the wake of what happened on 9-11. They think that you're too stupid to understand. They have contempt for the voters. Why? Because she can do anything for her loyal base. She sees us constantly. No matter what she does, 
These people will fall in line behind her, send her money, shower her with love and affection. So she thinks she can get away with anything. I think all the politicians start to believe that they can shoot somebody in the middle of the road because they have so many people who love them. But the hypocrisy is absolutely amazing. And I think a lot of these people have been saying for the longest time, I'm with her. Uh, now they're <laughs> getting a little bit shaky about that. They wish they could get somebody else in there. They wish they weren't stuck with her, but I think they are. What's coming up next, Owen? Well, me and Margaret Howe shot a segment on what is going on in London right now and how they're trying to basically Islamify London and they want the whole political correctness, you know, type of controlled speech atmosphere to try to bring in these people, scare people from speaking out against it, and then essentially just say this is in the name of tolerance, this is in the name of political correctness, this is in the name of ending you know, racism or injustice that is systematic in their cities. And that's same tactic why we see everywhere, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, you know, they same come tactic. out everything, all they see about people, the only thing they'll say, they won't argue any issues. We see this over and over again at the, at the rallies. They'll just say you're racist. They'll just label people. And then they'll come back and say, you're bigoted. No bigotry is when you put people in groups that you don't know anything about and you don't try to figure out what they're about. You just label them on the way that they look or where they stand or the clothes that they wear. That is true bigotry. That is uh, the, an inside job, just as I said in the last segment about sexism in the DNC. It truly is an inside job, and so is the Islamophobia. We'll be right back with Owen Schroer and Margaret Howell. Stay with us. I'm Margaret Hell for Infowars.com. I'm in studio with Owen Schroer. We're going to be talking about the London mayor and his appointee Owen, this deputy of integration uh, who worked with CAGE, this extremist organization that's been described by the Islamic State executioner Jihadi John. He describes him as a beautiful man. This is the new deputy mayor of London. Uh, according to Breitbart, his name is Matthew Ryder. His full title will be deputy mayor of London for social integration, social mobility and community engagement. He was appointed by Sadiq Khan this week. Uh, the thought police is in full force there in London. And this is a man who called uh, Jihadi, Jihadi John a beautiful man. Of course, he's been one of the most brutal ISIS terrorists in history. What do you make of this appointment? Well, it's another one of these made up positions and in integration chief. I mean, what, what does that even mean? These are made up positions that these social justice warriors are now bringing into our governments, bringing into our higher education systems. But you know, looking at some of the stuff this guy says, you know, it really is shocking it's, to think that somebody can come out and say some of the stuff that he says, and it has a lot of the same type of feelings and emotion-based uh, virtue signaling that we're seeing with the media and certain aspects of our government doing with African Americans in the United States of America, you know, trying to, whether it exists or not, trying to exploit oppression put a magnifying glass on oppression and then try to use emotion to try to stir civil unrest and then bring in whatever it is they see as the goal of the community for this new integration chief. It's basically Islamicizing or, or turning London into a Muslim neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. The boroughs of London, they want to make sure that anybody who is concerned about Islamic terrorism, they're going to be labeled as Islamic phobic, Islamophobic and possibly even jailed. We saw this with Marine Le Pen in France, where she would speak out and be concerned. And, the, you know, they were issuing issuing her jail time because of it. We're talking about Mr. Ryder, who spoke in 2013, this deputy mayor. He spoke alongside Mozambique. He was a former inmate in Guantanamo Bay who repeatedly admitted attending jihadi training camps and once signed a confession stating that he was an al-Qaeda recruiter. That's who his buddy is. Um, also, he was uh, the chairman of an event where Cage, and Cage is akin to Carr here in the U.S., um, he once said it's incumbent upon all of us to support jihad against Western forces was praising the example of militants in Iraq um, who banned the terrorist group Hezbollah. So we know which side that he falls on. And unfortunately, He's become a part of this thought police brigade where if you speak out and you're concerned against terrorism in your hometown, it, we're, we're going to see a push to where this is basically becoming illegal. Um, that, that's that's my fear and concern here, like we do in France. They have such major um, anti-terror laws, but the terrorists are those, in fact, that are speaking out against it. Well, they might pose as PC police, <laughs> but mm -hmm. they don't really care about offensive language. They don't want language and rhetoric that's going to stop their goal 
which is bringing in Islam into London. I mean, that's the <laughs> ultimate goal here. Mm -hmm. And as you just talked about, you know, Al Qaeda's leader, Aman al Zawahi, said, uh, and again, they're calling out now for African Americans in America to join ISIS, essentially, mm -hmm. and start using the same rhetoric of, you know, police against black people, white people against black people, to try to indoctrinate people in America that are black into ISIS. And he says that until this day, and no matter how much they try to reform and obtain their rights according to the law and the United States Constitution, they will not attain it, for the law is in the hands of the white majority who control it as they wish, and the blacks will not be saved but by Islam. Hmm. So this is a total attempt at an indoctrination of black people in America mm -hmm. into Islam. And again, it's not about them caring about black oppression. They want to conquer the world with Islam. Another story right here, Australian Cardinal says Muslims want Islamic conquest of Europe. So they're even admitting it. Mm -hmm. And as you have it's so shameless. eloquently showed, th the new integration chief is friends with radical Islamic terrorists. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this group called CAGE, um, they claim to stand up for Muslims who are persecuted by anti-terror laws. That's what they say. Uh, they were condemned by the previous prime minister of the UK, however, and described by left-wingers uh, left in the area as an advocacy group for Islamic fundamentalism in British society. So this is the new uh, Sadiq Khan's deputy mayor. And I just want to point out some highlights of his career. And I encourage you to take a look at this Breitbart article. His career as a barrister, it's focused on taking British police. So he attacks the police every time there's an issue of undercover surveillance, every time there's an, a, an issue of unlawful detention, as he puts it. Uh, they, they have a tendency, he had a tendency to go after and take on police officers for that in the UK. And it looks like the thought police is in full force. I know that you and I discussed offset uh, this unpolished diamonds comment. We're going to get to this in a second, but it seems to be pervasive of Western Europe and it's a total Soros push. They want to make sure that anybody challenging uh, Islam, radical Islam, is forced to stand down. They're even criminalized and uh, they're praising people who tend to who tend to ha come from a barbaric way of thinking um, and, and calling them even unpolished diamonds we've seen oh what well if they can't legally stop your free speech they're going to try to do it psychologically and mentally get you to back down where you're too afraid to say something that might get you in trouble or, or you're afraid you might offend somebody and as you just talked about they're trying to tie it in with the police now mm -hmm. the police are against muslims just like the media says the police are against black people in america Mm -hmm. And the new uh, integration chief says there's institutional racism in all organizations mm -hmm. and says there will be occasions when a problem remains embedded in public service and you need to take serious action. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is them admitting that they're coming to do something. They even said they don't want diverse communities even more. That's another quote I have from this guy. He doesn't want diverse communities. It sounds like a communist. This is right out of the communist manifesto. The religion of Islam is admitting they want to conquer Europe. We know what people like George Soros does mm -hmm. uh, to try to foment civil unrest. He called the Catholics unrest. Use, useful idiots because they welcomed Islam, you know, in the name of peace. These Catholics, these use, useful idiots is what he called them because they stand down in these communities and they welcome it um, in the name of, of God, if you will. It's, it's very bizarre, but he praises them. We know what the agenda is. We've tried to expose it here in InfoWars. Every single day we're out front exposing this agenda. And there are people like Milo Yiannopoulos so I want to take you to another article on Breitbart. And we've had Milo Yiannopoulos. He's been featured here in InfoWars repeatedly. Alex actually sat down with him during the RNC. And uh, he coined a piece in Breitbart. It's called The London I've Lost. And he goes into talking about how he's basically a refugee of the United, of the United States now. That he he's decided that he's no longer safe in London. He, he, he goes on to say, I know what they do to my kind. They throw them off of buildings. They hang them from cranes. And this is the adopted uh, religion of choice, if you will. We, we even have these thought police that are going to start jailing people if you speak out against it. And it's a really moving piece, though, and it really, it, it really makes you think about uh, what they're giving up in the name of cultural diversity. That's what they're doing. Well, and that's actual institutional racism or homophobia, whatever you want to call it. I mean, that's actually ingrained in their religious beliefs. So it's absurd for these people to come out and then try to talk to us mm -hmm. about systematic racism or, or, you know, problems in public service that are just 
you know, need immediate change. And then look at this double think. So we talked about the unpolished diamonds, these Turkish, <laughs> these Turkish migrants go yeah. into the Netherlands and then film themselves beating people up, Raping dancing women. on police cars. R correct. And then they just, they're, they're conferred, uh, said by a socialist party leader, Patrick Zumermeyer, that they're just unpolished diamonds. But it, it goes even further. In Kosovo, Muslims set fire and defecated in an Orthodox cathedral, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if this was Christians doing this to a mosque, the mainstream media would be all over it. Everyone we, from we the Islam side of this law. would be saying that it's anti-Muslim, anti-Islam, and we have to do something immediately. But no, that's not what we see in the media. Correct. So going back to Milo for a moment, he, he comes as a warning sign. He says, if you're scared of being called a racist for speaking out against Islam, think about what people will call you in a generation if you don't take a stand now. So he comes as a warning for this, and we're seeing Sadiq Khan uh, set up a uh, London government that is going to begin policing even the thought process, even your ability to say radical Islam in public, you could be jailed for that. You know, Milo wrote, you just might be fools if you don't recognize what's happening in your own streets. Today, we have another example of the absurdity of technology. Walmart developing a self-driving shopping cart. How much more ridiculous does it have to get? And as I've pointed out many times, I, I think that much of this technology is designed to turn us into children to essentially put us in a shopping cart, the kind of shopping cart where you've got a little, uh, you put your child in there and they got a little tiny wheel that's not connected to anything and it keeps them busy, it keeps them happy. That's what a lot of this technology is there for. Keeps you busy and happy while they do something else. But take a look at what Walmart is doing. They say the retailers filed a patent for a shopping cart that has a motor and video cameras. The best part, it would be able to return itself from customers' cars to the store. Oh yeah, isn't that great? Let me tell you something. If they actually go through with this, the only reason they're going to do this, the only reason they would spend the money, can you imagine how phenomenally expensive this would be? And of course, if you're like me, you've had your car hit in Walmart parking lots and other parking lots more times than you care uh, to think about. We don't need to start putting motors on these things as well. But the only reason that they would do this is because Walmart would like to put an app on your computer so that uh, you, they could follow you, okay? That's what's gonna be involved with this, so that they can mine your data, so they can look at what you're doing, so they can sell to you better. But today, I wanna talk, because there's other self-driving car news here, as we see where this is all heading. Understand that where this is heading is just like putting you in the shopping cart and giving you a little a wheel to turn. It's far more sinister than that. They've had a plan for a very long time, and we can see this now in the plans of Ford Motor Company, for example, two announcements, one on Monday, another one today. And we can see where the globalists are heading with this. They want to turn you into renters. This is a very serious story about globalism. Understand that the automobile industry has been the engine of prosperity, not only for America and Detroit, but also for countries like Japan or South Korea. And when we lose this, when we ship our jobs overseas, when we take away our, and it's not just economic freedom, okay? It's also been the freedom to move, to travel, uh, to move about within society anonymously without somebody controlling or limiting your movements or having it done on a schedule. All this is about to change with a, coll a collusion between the crony capitalists and the government. Let's take a look, though, first at this story about Vincente Fox begging Americans today to stop Trump. And at the essence of this, this is coming Interestingly enough, on the same day that the Ford CEO is talking about moving all U.S. small car production to Mexico, Vicente Fox said, wake up, America. He's former president of Mexico. Wake up, America, he said to the Washington Post. I want to warn people here in the U.S. to watch out for this false prophet, Donald Trump, that has promised gold, that has promised paradise, that has promised everything. Hey, you know what? The false prophets are the ones who sold you NAFTA. The false prophets are the ones who are trying to sell you the Trans-Pacific Transatlantic Partnership who wrote that in secret. They are the liars. They're the ones who are deceiving you. People like Vincente Fox, because look at uh, what he's known for. As we point out in this article at Infowars.com, Fox wanted the U.S. to join Mexico and Canada into an EU-style North American Union, not just the free trade agreement, but the North American Union, like the EU, which would combine all three countries into one regional government using one currency, like the, e like the euro, 
at the expense of both U.S. national sovereignty and our individual rights. He said in a book that he wrote, his autobiography, Revolution of Hope, he said, I proposed a NAFTA plus plan to President Bush and Canada's Prime Minister Jean Chrétien to move us toward a single continental economic union modeled on the European example. Oh, boy, I'm sure Sorry we didn't jump into that, uh, <laughs> that cauldron at the time. He says, at summits, I took every opportunity to advocate clearly for free market policies, showing what sound economies, economics could do to fund social justice. I argued for globalism, for NAFTA, for the free trade area of the Americas. Now, how was that working out? We talked about the fact that before NAFTA, we had a rough trade parity between the U.S. and Mexico. Some years we had a surplus, some years we had a deficit with them. As soon as they passed NAFTA, we had a trade deficit of $15 billion, and it never got smaller. It has only increased. This last year it was $60 billion. Every year for the last, and I forget how many, it's about 25 years since we've had NAFTA, we've had a trade deficit like that, $15 billion or more with Mexico. Now we see today. The, the CEO of Ford Motor Company, Mark Fields, told investors today in Dearborn, Michigan, over the next two years, we will have migrated all of our small car production to Mexico. Shifting their assemblies to Mexico can reduce cost to a point, but as the Detroit Free Press points out, these cars are over-engineered. Well, that's by federal mandate. They say the future of smaller cars in the U.S. may depend on the ability to electrify their powertrains to introduce them to ride-sharing fleets, and that's where they are focusing folks, because on Monday, the Ford CEO, Mark Fields, came out and said, um, we're going to have driverless cars. We're going to have them by 2021. Remember, we've been told for a long time the globalist grand plans are going to be coming to fruition around 2020 or 2025. Whenever you look at all of their plans, it's always one of those two dates. Interestingly enough, they're now saying we're going to take over transportation by 2021. And let me say this, too. I have a lot of people who always, whenever I criticize self-driving cars, especially when I criticize the crony capitalist Elon Musk, they get very angry about that. And I have to tell them, you have to look beyond the bells and whistles of the technology, beyond the pretty little displays that they create. Look at the larger system. Look at the technology from a system level. You will understand that humans and robot cars cannot coexist at the same time. In order to make their robot cars work, they're going to have to put limitations on human drivers. They're going to have to eliminate human drivers from the road. But part of that, as they phase this in, is going to be to put a, to make the roads actually literal information highways where they monitor everything that you do, where they tax you uh, for every mile that you're driven, where they monitor all of your speed and so forth and will charge you accordingly for that to the point where you will no longer be able to afford to drive your car. That's the other freedom besides the economic prosperity that we lose and the economic freedom that we lose. We also will lose our freedom to travel. But what he said that I thought was interesting was he would have the self-driving cars by 2021 and five years perhaps later, they would begin to sell them to individuals. They're going to keep these cars and they're going to rent them as part of a ride sharing fleet. Because you have to understand that what the crony capitalist billionaires want to do is to own everything. They want to own everything. They want to turn you into a renter. Now, we have seen this on the national, international level with the International Monetary Fund. When we had Robert McNamara take that over, sell third world countries on welfare states, get them hopelessly in debt where they couldn't get out. And people criticized him for that. They said the IMF is rent seeking. Let me tell you what the crony capitalists like the people who run Ford, like the Uber executives, okay? Like Elon Musk, they want to own everything. They want you to be a renter. They don't want you to own your home. They want you to rent from them. It's more profitable, far more profitable. They want you to be serf servants to them. They want you to be sharecroppers, not own the farm. They want you to be a sharecropper. Take a look at uh, Uber. Now, of course, they today they hit the streets uh, at Pittsburgh, and now they are showing their self-driving cars. They say they have four self-driving cars made available to passengers today in Pittsburgh. And as the press points it out dutifully, cheerleading press of the self-driving cars, they say it was all done without a person touching the controls. And then under this large picture, they say, but the Uber driver and the engineer in the front two seats did intervene every few miles. In other words, the technology is not here. Okay, but I'm not concerned about whether or not they can make the technology work. I'm not even concerned about the safety 
that we continue to see. And today we had a, yet another report about a Tesla crash. This one was in China. This one was covered up for eight months. Remember the first fatal crash that we had with a Tesla self-driving car? That was covered up for two months because they covered that up for two months with the help of the Federal Oversight Agency for two months, uh, the transportation agency that should have, over, uh, should have made that public. They were able to make a lot of money in the stock market. So the SEC is, coming, is investigating Tesla. There are shareholders who are suing Tesla who bought the, the stock before, while this information was kept secret. And yet, and at the time, they were saying, even after they released it after uh, two months, they said, oh, but it wasn't an autopilot. Then we find out that it was, okay? Then they said, well, it was a break, or so whatever. Now we're seeing the same thing in China. Eight months, they kept this secret, and now they're pulling this out. They have to go to self-driving cars, and they want to turn you into renters. That's precisely what Uber is doing. Uber says, our business model will fail if we don't get rid of the humans. Well, that's it for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for the InfoWars Nightly News.